Yes. So why did you choose this project as your project? That's actually interesting. So a few years ago, my dad um, went on a business trip, and he came back and told me that in the city, I think it was Brazil, there were super tall buildings, and at the top, the richest, richest, richest people lived. And with, with their helicopters and stuff, and then at the bottom, on the streets, were all the poor people. And the people on the top cho are like choosing not to see what's going on below. And I thought, I can't help that I don't live in Brazil. This is my community. <laughs> my project's supposed to be on our community. And then I was realizing the same thing's kind of happening around here because it's such an affluent county that no, there can't possibly be what was it, 900 homeless people here. There can't possibly be one in 17 children living in poverty. So there's one story that I think back on a lot just because it's a really inspirational young person. His name is Brian. He ended up moving in with just another group of people that he didn't know and didn't feel comfortable with and he didn't really have his own space. And he talked about feeling like no one saw him uh, and no one could understand his experiences because they never took the time to really dig into what was going on with him at home after school. He said to me, I can't remember exactly how he said it, but it was something like the moment that I found out about Second Story, everything changed for me. So even for Brian, just having a safe place to sleep at night was really what made all the difference for him. You don't really think of, uh, of a clothing drive in a church hall being, uh, being about life and death, but it is. Close your eyes for a second and picture a homeless person. What do you see? Most people see the guy on the corner panhandling or selling CDs. They see uh, people who they think are maybe druggies or alcoholics. But the majority of the homeless are people who are working. They have jobs. Almost 80% of the people who are homeless are working. And most of those people have families. We live in one of the most, one of the richest counties in the country. And you would think that there is very little poverty, very little homelessness, and you'd be completely wrong. 5.8% um, of the people who live in Fairfax County live in poverty. Uh, the, the statistics on poverty and homelessness in Fairfax County are very disturbing. Poverty line is $50,000 for a family of four. The average wage in Fairfax County is $145,000. And the average cost of a home is $540,000. Where it takes a family of four in Fairfax an estimated $70,000 just to keep themselves above water. Most of these people are earning either below 50 or below $25,000 a year. Uh, these are centralized in particular groups of people who are at risk. I, for example, women, uh, women who have children um, do not have a spouse and those kids are under 18 have a, a better than 21% poverty rate. Um, young men who have, uh, who have not gone on to college have a 10% poverty, poverty rate. 41.5% um, of the people who live in poverty in Fairfax County have no health insurance, which is a quick way of guaranteeing that you stay in poverty. There are, and it's hard to believe because this is one of the richest counties in the country, there are over 20,000 households at extreme risk of losing their homes. And the reason is because of the disparity between income and the cost of living in Fairfax County. These are families who live here because there's work here, but a broken car, an illness that's not covered by insurance, or a loss of a second or third job because many of them hold multiple jobs, and they have to make a choice between do I fix my car or do I pay my rent? And if they fix their car so they can keep their jobs, then they lose their homes. 
they have to go to county services for help for food, for housing, for utilities. Uh, last year, 4,700 people went to Fairfax County Services to get uh, food assistance. 4,500 people went to get assistance to pay their rent. Um, the statistics are technically there are only 964 homeless people in Fairfax County. However, um, that doesn't count all the students who are homeless living on a friend's couch. That's not part of the statistics. There are over 3,000 students who are homeless in Fairfax County. Teen poverty and homelessness in Fairfax County is significantly more present than you would imagine, I would presume. Um, there was a study done through Fairfax County Public Schools the 2016 to 2017 school year that found that one in five young people were showing up to school hungry as a result of um, a lack of food in the home, which is incredibly high compared to what we see in our community, all the affluence and um, all of the resources, but one in five young people. Um, and they also found that there were 1,200 young people who were unaccompanied, which means that they didn't have the support of a parent or guardian. Um, 1,200 young people in Fairfax County. So it's very present, and it's just not really something that we understand because we don't see it. I've coached teenagers in baseball for over 10 years. Yeah, most of them are in a good situation because it's Fairfax County, but you know, this it doesn't escape everybody. My name is Bill Grossman, and I am the head of the Service and Community Growth Ministries here at St. Mark Catholic Church. And I've been here for I'm doing this for about 10 years. And um, it's basically a ministry's uh, in charge of a lot of volunteers that, um, that handle a lot of the service and um, activities that happen outside the walls here and inside the walls. So it's a very, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on here. It doesn't get passed down to the kids. Is being in poverty. We want to get that cycle broken as fast as we can. So if we get the parent housed in, in jobs and good health, then their kids will benefit from that and they won't go through that when they get older. So that's our main goal. And it's long-term goals, so we don't really see the answers, but we know we're helping people. And that's all we can do. Every day I have a list of things that I need to get done, but um, uh, the most important thing is when people walk in this door or they um, um, call on the phone that we are here to help them in whatever their needs are and the needs vary from so many different things um, you know from the elderly needing a ride somewhere to um, you know to children with with some you know, emotional issues or um, it, it's a big variety so um, you know we don't get a lot of teenagers that will come here look you know that are homeless but we help them a lot because we're dealing with their mom or their dad. In a lot of cases, it's a single mom with two or three kids. Not that they're all like that, but um, that's how most in this area end up in that situation. They get out with the kids and then they're stuck with, oh my God, what are we gonna do? So organizations like Family Pass and another one called Facets, and there's also Family Services in Northern Virginia. Those three and many others help these families, you know, get housed and, and get, them, get them moving specifically know from the kids I've taught or over the years that there are a couple of them, a few of them who have been in that situation or they have friends that have been in that situation and um, you know, I've helped directly with with that person or, or two. There's a team that I helped um, that I coached, probably one of the first teams I coached 10 years ago so he's probably in his mid-20s by now but um, he was in a bad family situation and he also had some emotional issues himself and uh, there were many a times he I could just sense there was something wrong with him and I would just after practice come talk to him one-on-one -on -one and say hey what's going on and he he confided in me um, he had been living in his friend's basement for some time and we talked about you know why what was going on at home and um, although I didn't give him anything directly because the family he was staying with was helping him a lot um, I was just able to work through some things with him and try to get him help with his emotional part and um, he eventually went back home and as far as I know you know things have worked out for him he went on to college and played baseball and is now working so second story and family pass are two big organizations that we work with that work with homeless families uh, low-income family folks that are 
almost going to be homeless, and if one more bad thing happens to them, they will be homeless. So our, our goal really, we probably help more of those kind of families that have children, obviously, um, to prevent them from being homeless. Hi, I'm Pat Kearns. I'm the executive director of Family Pass, a nonprofit that helps the homeless. Family Pass was started in the basement of a house right up the street on Oak Valley Drive. A woman, Suzette Steinhardt, and her husband, Alan, felt that the people who were receiving help for homelessness were not getting the depth of assistance that they needed to really truly get on their feet. What we strive to do at Family Pass is to take people who are at high risk of homelessness or those who've already become homeless, find them housing, stabilize their situation, and then provide them with the resources so that they can become financially independent. The 964 people who are homeless, most of those are families, and the majority of those families are headed by women. Um, but that number still pales in comparison to the over 20,000 households in Fairfax that are at high risk. And that, those are the people we focus on trying to get people to stay in their homes. That we want these families to be able to support themselves, not only just to keep their heads above water, but to go beyond that. And that's why our case management goes on for several years, where most programs only last one. And again, our program is focused on people making their own choices with help from Family Pass case managers. If you're going to live in Fairfax County, you've got to be able to have the education and job skills to do so. Of those 964 technically homeless people, almost 300 of them are children. So when you think about homeless, um, try to think about it in terms of these are people working as hard as they can, but just cannot make it without that extra help. A lot of our families are very protective of their dignity, and we're protective of their dignity as well. Um, just because you're homeless, or you're about to lose your home, or you're taking assistance from someone, doesn't mean you should lose your dignity. There are so many great stories about families who have gone through our program. Her story is amazing. She was a survivor of domestic abuse. She was estranged from her family. Um, she went into a shelter. We got her from the shelter and we uh, provided her with the support and educational support to get her, uh, she's gotten a degree in uh, human resource management. She's now an assistant director of a human resource management company. She is searching for her own home now. She's ready to purchase. Her daughter is a star figure skater and uh, she's gotten top security clearance. So this is one of the many stories. Last year we had three clients who left our program after completing our program each of them earning over sixty thousand dollars a year. Earlier, that the, the name Second Story is perfect for that group um, because it gives them it's a second chance thing, you know. And a lot of kids want to wipe out that first story and start a new life. So I'm Abigail Brocker, and I am the communication specialist at Second Story. Second Story's mission is to transform the lives of children and youth through providing safe shelters and opportunities for young people to grow and thrive. And we do that through providing safe havens like the Emergency Shelter for Teens, providing rental assistance through our programs like our long-term residential programs, and those safe spaces and opportunities to grow and thrive um, in after-school programs and family resource centers. Second Story was founded in 1972. It was originally called um, Juvenile Assistance of McLean. It was founded in a church parking lot and they worked out of a trailer there as the teen shelter, which is our founding program. And it was just that one program that existed for quite a while. And then over the years, as other needs started to develop, we added some of our other programs. So it expanded to uh, the Safe Youth Projects later on expanded to Second Story for Young Mothers. We started working with pregnant and parenting teen moms, started working with homeless youth in the community, 18 to 24 years old, and of course continued with the emergency teen shelter that we started off as, um, and expanded to the community-based family resource centers, and then eventually 
we changed our name to Second Story. We were known as Alternative House before Juvenile Assistance of McLean didn't last very long. And now we've transformed into this new name, Second Story, with the wide range of programs. So we see this in our programs daily. I mean, we, we see young people who are hungry every day in our community-based programs. Obviously, we see young people who are either homeless or don't live in a safe situation at our, at our teen shelter or in our long-term residential programs. There's a wide range of reasons why a young person might end up in need of services like Second Stories, and it depends program to program. So we kind of divide our programs into residential programs and community-based programs. Um, as far as those longer-term residential programs, sometimes a young person is kicked out of their home by their parents. So when a young person turns 18, maybe they've transitioned out of foster care, aged out, we call it or their parent or guardian has just told them they don't want them there anymore and legally there are no repercussions for that. So that doesn't mean that they automatically can provide for themselves, especially in an area like Fairfax County where housing is really expensive. And then as far as community-based programs, those are more after-school resource-based. So that's due to poverty in the community. So um, it, a lot of times it's cyclical poverty. Um, They've grown up in poverty, they continue in poverty because they never had opportunities to go to school or learn some kind of trade where they could make a, a reasonable a living wage. Um, and so they're impoverished and they have a hard time knowing how to get out of that kind of situation and need resources like ours. So our emergency teen shelter is physically, literally a teen shelter located on Gallows Road in Vienna, Virginia, Fairfax County. And it's a house, it's not like a you know, a corporate or like clinical type of shelter. It's a house that we own and young people can come and stay for up to three weeks at a time. They have their own bedroom, they have access to counseling, group therapy, family counseling, um, and are constantly surrounded by people who are not only helping them work through some of the issues uh, for which they would have ended up at the teen shelter, but also helping them pursue longer term goals that they may not have processed before. So when I when I was living in the, the place where I was living in Arkansas, it was a community a lot like the one I had grown up in, and realized that there were good schools and um, community programs and still young people who were homeless and not being cared for, it just blew my mind. And I couldn't imagine that this was going on and no one had told me about it, or I didn't have more access to that kind of information. And so I became really passionate about working so that that wouldn't persist in my community. So there's one story that I think back on a lot just because it's a really inspirational young person. His name is Brian. Um, so Brian moved to this area when he was in high school. And he ended up moving in with his cousin, uh, but that wasn't a good situation. They weren't getting along, his cousin wasn't respecting him, and he ended up moving in with just another group of people that he didn't know and didn't feel comfortable with, and he didn't really have his own space. Uh, he was sleeping not in a real bed there were all kinds of other people that were kind of partying in the apartment and he didn't he didn't feel safe and he wasn't able to have an environment that was conducive to learning while in school or being able to pursue his hobbies and his goals so he ended up working 12 hours every day after school he would finish school and then he would go and work at a restaurant and get back at like two or three in the morning not have had any sleep and then have to go to school the next day and he talked about feeling like no one saw him uh, and no one could understand his experiences because they never took the time to really dig into what was going on with him at home after school. Um, and eventually, Brian got to know some of his teachers better. He is incredibly smart, and his teachers realized that he didn't have a safe place to sleep at night. So they connected him with Second Story. And he has, he said to me, I can't remember exactly how he said it, but it was something like the moment that I found out about Second Story, everything changed for me because I had a safe place to go, so I was doing better in school because I could focus when I was studying. I didn't have to go to bed every morning at 2, 3 a.m. because I had a more affordable place to live. You know, in high school, you can't be expected to pay your own living. And he got a really great scholarship, um, and he'll be going to college next year. So even for Brian, just having a safe place to sleep at night was really what made all the difference for him. He didn't have to spend all of his time working, he felt safe, he could focus on his homework, and then the other resources that Second Story provided too were just the icing on the cake for him. Teens can help out in a lot of ways, but it's just really the same ways that adults or 
anybody can really help. There's any organization needs needs help. You know, churches need help. Family Pass needs help, and they they can they can um, look on websites websites, call up and just say, hey, I need a I need a I just want to help somebody. So what can I do? Teens can help out anywhere in in anything. And one of the things I tell teens and other people, if you really want to get started, figure out what what touches you. What, what do you what do you who do you want to help? What kind of people do you want to help? What what makes you tick? Kind of thing. Uh, my name is Paul Renard. I'm the director of the St. Mark's Catholic Church Thanksgiving Clothing Drive. Uh, professionally, I am a professor at George Washington University School of Medicine, and I also have a strategy consulting company with Department of Defense and companies that support them. Thanksgiving Clothing Drive at St. Mark's has been around for at least 30 years. It's a huge event that brings in somewhere between 12 and 15 tons of used clothes each year. That gets distributed to 15 local charities, plus we have what we call uh, personal shoppers who come in one, one day during the clothing drive to select clothes from their family. And we'll typically have about 300 people who are shopping on those days. And that's what the clothing dive is about, to try and make, to try and make it easier for people to make hard choices. If you don't have to worry about buying clothes for your kids, what you can do is use that money to turn on the heat in the house or feed them. The clothing drive, like I said, supports 15 local charities, sometimes 16, sometimes 13. It goes up and down a little bit each year. But the type of charities are uh, almost exclusively within the Washington area. Places like uh, Community for Creative Nonviolence in Washington, so others might eat. Um, the Annandale Christian Community for Action, uh, better known as ACA. Uh, Salvation Army. Uh, Christ House in Washington, with the with the focus being typically on folks who are who are homeless or who are um, employed but are not making enough to live in the area. The number of people that we touch with the clothing drive each year is somewhere in the order of a thousand to two thousand people. The clothing the clothing drive is exclusively a St. Mark's operation, almost. So I have a charitable outreach person. His job each year is to talk to the charities, see what they need, and we do that exclusively ourselves. But over the years, what's happened is we've spawned a couple, uh, a couple um, the children, children clothing drives. And I don't mean that these are clothing drives for children. I mean these are clothing drives where people have seen what we're doing, have made a contact with us, and some of them happen. Uh, some of them happen a little bit before us. Some of them happen a little bit after us. And what we do is take their leftover clothes and uh, and reuse it, or provide clothes to help them get uh, get a head start on whatever they're doing. I, every uh, every charity that we work with has an order form, and they say, for example, uh, so others might eat, may tell us, I want 30 pairs of men's jeans. 25 pairs of work, book, work boots, 50 men's winter coats suitable for living on the street, um, and 10 pairs of gloves. And what I will do is take a group of teens and say, okay, here's the order. Here, here are 12 to 15 tons of clothes stacked up um, on a table or in boxes. That's a lot of clothes. And they will, and they will dig through them to, to try and fill that order. Or we'll have people, we'll have charities that will say, we're helping people re-enter into the workforce. We need to interview clothes. And so I'll ask a group of teens to go through the clothes and find um, a dozen nice men's suits, a dozen nice women's suits, shirts, ties, belts, socks, shoes that go together and put together wardrobes that would, um, that would help people when they go out to uh, seek a job. Let me tell you a couple of stories about the clothing drive. I'm going to tell you one that's pretty dire. The woman from Catholic Charities came up to me and said, we'd like you to help this woman. Um, unfortunately, she only speaks French. And my response was, maybe you should go français. And we had, we had a lovely and disturbing conversation. Uh, she had been taken from her country in West Africa and kept as a slave here. 
um, she was she was kept by one of the people in her country's embassy. Um, she had a daughter while she was kept in slavery. She had escaped, had found her way to Catholic Charities. They had found a place for her to live, but she didn't have anything. I, and so I looked around among the teens who had had a couple years of French, and we set her and her daughter up with a, with a complete wardrobe um, for their house. Um, another, another one was a letter I got from Christ House a couple years ago where uh, they had put in a, put in a request for uh, specifically very heavy men's winter coats because a lot of their clients, more clients than normal, were living on the street that year, and it was a cold year. And so we had, um, we had provided the coats. And the letter said, you know, we'd like to thank you for the coats. Um, we believe that several of our clients survived the winter because of the coats you provided. And that was, uh, uh, you don't really think of, uh, of a clothing drive in a church hall being, uh, being about life and death, but it is. Right? Uh, one of the things that I do in, in finding volunteers for, for the clothing drive is to talk to the 7th and 8th grade religious ed kids at St. Mark's. And I ask them to, to think about drawing a circle around, around St. Mark's. Uh, about five, with about a five mile radius, um, and think about the people who live inside that, and most likely you're thinking about people who are very well to do. And the fact is, there are enclaves of people who don't make much money, who have to make very hard choices about whether they buy clothes for their kids, whether they put food on the table, whether they put gas in their car to get to work, whether they put, whether they pay for heat, what kind of apartment they live in. But fortunately, but fortunately, with the clothing drive, because because most of the work is being done um, by uh, by teens between roughly seventh grade and twelfth grade, though I occasionally get some college kids, and I do have some I do have some adults who come who come in and work with us. Um, they have a lot of energy, they have a lot of enthusiasm, and unlike adults, they'll actually do what you ask them to do. Um, I think it's fantastic. When uh, when young people realize that they can they have power and that they can control things, and it's not just political power; it's social power to help other people. I, anyone who's been engaged with Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, you know, anybody who's worked in social action has has known that. Uh, what I try and do is promote that among the folks who um, who come in and help us. If we don't have teens working with us, I'm dead. I am physically not capable of doing of doing the work. So what do they do? Um, they sort clothes, they move boxes, they package things up, they do order fulfillment. There's plenty of opportunities for teens to help people in poverty. Uh, there's lots of organizations uh, that are engaged in that. There are a lot of there are a lot of food security organizations around that like people to come in and help with food kitchens and with uh, and with distribution. There's there's just no shortage of opportunities to work. Teens can absolutely help with what we're doing at Second Story. There are volunteer opportunities that change month to month. So if you look on our website, you contact our Director of Resource Management, there are opportunities there. Um, a huge one that we love for teens to be involved in is coming to our open door information sessions because a lot of times this is their peer group. So, you know, I was talking about Brian feeling like he didn't really have anyone who understood what he was going through. Perhaps the people who would have been most aware of Brian's situation were his peers. So young people understanding not only what Second Story does, but also that these issues exist in our community is really powerful and really important. The Second Story, um, we've been helping them, basically just funding. They put out a list every month on their website, things they need to keep a house going with teenagers. So, you know, it could be any of this bathroom products, food, Volunteers are very important to Family Pass. We use them for a number of uh, projects. We have volunteers who collect Easter baskets for the kids, who provide backpacks and um, school equipment. All of that costs a lot of money. Um, sometimes we have volunteers who tutor our uh, students, uh, the children of their, the, our clients. And there are some things that I, I think people should realize about food banks, food
food drives and clothing drives. They're wonderful, uh, but we find that they're only done like once or twice a year, and people don't realize that these people need help all year long. When, when teens and anybody help others, they always want to see the direct result of it. Like they want to see that, that their money or that they put this thing together that's going to help this homeless person. But that doesn't happen a lot. I'd say 98% of the time you're, you're doing this volunteer work and you don't see the result. That's one of the hard things that teens and adults have a problem with. It's because it's they want to see direct result, but they just, they just have to learn and know that what they're doing is good and trust that, you know, whoever they're helping indirectly is going to help them. Just overall, I think being aware, regardless of how you're learning about the issue, Second Story is a great way because we work directly with this population and we work directly with teen poverty and homelessness. So the open door is a really good way to learn more about that. Um, but just understanding and knowing the resources that are available and knowing what teen poverty and teen homelessness looks like so they're able to understand that in their peer group. And also just being aware of your surroundings and how this is happening and you probably have peers in your classroom that are going through these kind of things. So just be aware that if you're, if you're saying something that someone next to you might be the best way students can help. I mean, volunteering is wonderful. We don't have that many volunteer operation, you know, opportunities. But just being aware of your fellow students and what you can do. It's the way to involve. And the more you help others, the more you think less of your problems. And it's amazing how you know, how you can grow and be a better person just by helping others. <laughs> I just think people have to be kind to other people.